particular project ensures that philosophers, scholars, historians, and their works could be highlighted and brought to the across to the borders of these two countries and others. Austria and India together have so immensely worked and contributed in different spheres which are still remains to be unearthed. It is ACF's endeavor to bring this, these features to the audience of both the countries, thereby highlighting not only the personalities, their, contrib their contribution, but also their works and their works. One such personality from Austria we are going to discuss in detail today, or briefly I would rather say, because detail uh, will be a bit injustice, injustice to say that we could discuss about him in an hour's time, which is too less. And we are going to discuss about Moritz Winternitz, through whose works we will come to know about different features and aspects of Vedas, Upanishads, and at the same time, this person was, or this scholar, I would rather say, was known as the, as the, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, father of Indian literature. So, him we are going to discuss, and to discuss him, it's not an easy job, or to talk about him, we needed illustrious scholars, panelists of, of the same, you know, rank, and among us we have different panelists who would navigate the evening and also at the same time navigate through the lives and the contribution of Moritz Winternitz. So without losing much time, I would like to start the program, but before that, I would like to really welcome here the deputy head of the Austrian Culture Forum, Mr. Matthias Radostich, who has been a brain behind this, not only this lecture series, but also uh, of different personalities whom we had, you know, been discussing in the past, and we will continue to do so. May I request Mr. Matthias Radostech, the Deputy Head of Austrian Embassy, to come and open the session, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you, Munish. Um, I think it's a bit exaggerated if you call me the brain behind this. Uh, but of course, I try to lend my support as much as I can. Now, um, as you pointed out, um, this is part of our occasional lecture series, which we started more or less two years ago. Uh, which was interrupted uh, uh, by the pandemic. So some sessions were online, some sessions were live, some sessions were hybrid. Uh, like today, uh, we're conducting a hybrid session because I understand that people are becoming reluctant again, unfortunately, uh, to come out and to attend events uh, due to the rising COVID numbers here in Delhi again. Um, in, during these lecture series, um, we explore personalities, uh, which um, have contributed uh, uh, something to whatever field um, uh, to India. And it's, it's amazing uh, how many personalities we actually found who have uh, 
you know, done quite a contribution to, uh, to these countries and uh, the, the strong connections between Austria and India. And today we're discussing one of them, uh, Mr. Moritz Winternitz, who is, uh, as, you, as you called him, and you all nodded, the father of Indian literature. So we're very proud that the father of Indian literature actually comes from Austria. I wouldn't have thought that before I uh, got to know it. <laughs> so I'm very proud. And uh, so I, I wish you all an, an interesting session. Thank you very much. And uh, I give the word over to you. And of course, to the, to the much more knowledgeable people, because after all, we came here to listen to you who know more about it, not to us who know less. So thank you very much, and over to you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Matthias uh, Radostic. I think I'm improving in the pronunciation. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, uh, Munish ji, for uh, giving me this opportunity uh, today to, to be part of this session. And uh, Austrian Cultural Forum New Delhi has really been very active. And uh, as Matthias Radostis uh, just told us that we have been able to find personalities related to art, literature, geology, architecture, and today uh, the uh, Indic and uh, Sanskrit studies. So it's really phenomenal. And all this has been done in the last two years, which is really phenomenal when most of the institutions were, were sitting quiet and, uh, and looking for opportunities. Uh, Austrian Cultural Forum had already started it. Uh, initially uh, on, online mode, then digital mode, where both physical and uh, online session uh, took place. <coughs> so uh, before uh, we start this session on Morris Winternitz, I would like to introduce you to today's panelists. Uh, Dr. Professor Girish Nath Jha, uh, on my left. Professor uh, Grishna Jha is professor in School of Sanskrit and Indic Studies in Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. Uh, professor Jha specialized in uh, linguistic and computational Sanskrit. That's, uh, in fact, he not just in Sanskrit, but he's also trying to uh, create the interface between uh, the language Sanskrit and uh, the informatics, uh, the computers. Then uh, we have with us uh, Professor Sudhir Lal, uh, who is my colleague at Indira Gandhi National Center for the Arts. Uh, Professor uh, Sudhir Lal uh, has recently received an award uh, called Acharya Chanakya Samman from Houston, United States. Uh, in addition to that, uh, Professor Sudhir Lal ji is also uh, looking after a very, very important uh, division uh, of the IGNCA, which really has got direct uh, relationship with this uh, the subject on, uh, of uh, Indology. We call it as Bharatiya Vidya Prayojan. Uh, he's heading uh, that division and uh, is with us. So thank you very much, Sudhir ji. Then uh, we also have uh, with us uh, another colleague of mine uh, from Indira Gandhi National Center for the Arts, uh, Dr. Sushma Jattuji. She is a profound uh, Sanskrit scholar, and she specializes in Kashmiri Shaivism. Uh, in addition to this, she is heading the, uh, the, the most important division of the IGNCA, which is Kala Kosh. In fact, uh, the heart of Indira Gandhi National Center for the Arts, which works on uh, the fundamental text of India, the, the comparative uh, studies and all, is uh, this. We have projects like Kala Tattva Kosh, Kala, um, Kala Mool Shastra, and Kala Sam Alochan uh, series, which is being headed. And pub we, in this division has come out with phenomenal uh, and seminal uh, publications of the IGNCA, in fact, which is the, the foundation of the institution. 
So I welcome you, ma'am, here. And uh, on my right side uh, is my colleague, uh, my friend, my younger brother, uh, Dr. Abhishid, Abhijit Dikshit ji, who is uh, again a Sanskrit scholar, and he's also assistant professor at uh, Indira Gandhi National Center for the Arts. And he has come all the way from uh, the Varanasi to uh, attend this uh, panel discussion and uh, has really helped us a lot in uh, bringing out information on uh, modest winter needs. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Abhijit Dikshit. Now uh, I would like to request uh, Dr. Abhijit Dikshit ji to throw some light on the life of uh, modest winter needs, please. Tasmat Dednat Sarva Hutar, Sama Nijadni Re, Chanda Gumsi Jadni Re, Tasmat Dejus Tasmat Dejayata, Agyana Timiranda Sia, Gyana and Jan Shalakaya, Chakchurun Militam Yena, Tasmai Shri Guru Venama. The distinguished works of Sir Winter Nates mainly focused on Sanskrit and also Pali and Prakrit literature were incredible tasks and had no ancestor and which have never repeated till date. Definitely, Winternitz had magnificently mastered this task. He is known to Indian students primarily as a historian of Indian literature due to his magnum opus published over many years from 1908 to 1920. He was a prolific writer both in German and English. On several aspects, the Indology and an authority in the field of Sanskrit textual criticism. He was born in December 23, 1863 in Horn, a provincial town in Lower Austria. After finishing his studies in grammar school of his native town, he entered the University of Vienna in 1880 for higher studies in classical philology and philosophy. Here, he shaped his future. Under the inspiring guidance of French Muller and George Buller for classical literature and Indology. After obtaining his doctorate in 1885, titled Ancient Indian Marriage Ritual According to Apastamb Compared with the Marriage Customs of the Indo European People, he finished his PhD in this title. And at the age of 23, he came across the great opportunity of his scholarly life in 1888, when he joined the post of eminence to assist Professor Mueller for the preparation of second edition of Rig Ved. Sooner, sooner his scholarly distinction was appreciated by Professor Max Mueller. In 1891, he has accepted the post of a teacher at the Oxford higher school of girls, and in 1895, he was appointed a lecturer in German by the Association for the Promotion of Higher Education of Women at Oxford. He was also a member of the examining board of the Indian Civil Service. He, while he continued in the post of a lecturer in German till 1898, he was called upon in 1895 to undertake some very important library works. The first of these was cataloging the Vedic manuscript in Bodleian Library. After this, Professor Winternitz had set his hand to the task of preparing a general index to the 49 volumes of the Secret Books of the East series, while one should have felt amazed at the versatility of this genius v Professor Winternitz, which must have brought to bear upon such di uh, diversified tasks. It is impossible to underestimate the extent to which his instinct for research had been stimulated and enriched by the busy years he spent at Oxford. In 1989, Professor Winternitz was appointed as a lecturer of Indo-Aryan philology and ethnology at the University of Prague where within three years he was appointed as an assistant professor and was eventually raised in 1911 to chair for the subject. Here, one might say that Maurice Winternitz owed as much as to the university as the university owed to the professor. The post-war period, which raised him to higher ranks of eminence, eminence witnessed 
him elected as a dean of the Faculty of Letters in 1921. He came down to India in 1922 at the invitation of Sir Rabindranath Tagore and spent a year in India as a visiting professor at the Vishwabharati. Long before this visit, Professor Winternitz had, carrying, had been carrying on research on the critical edition of the great epic Mahabharata. The one another great work which will ever remain associated with the memories of distinguished professor is the history of Indian literature written in three volumes of about 1600 pages and published over the period of 15 years. The first coming out in 1907 and the last is 1922. It is in a sense that outstanding monuments of his Indological studies and the encyclopedic intellect evidence in it constitutes an unmistakable testimony of the fact that none other than Professor Winternitz. The last 14 years of his life were devoted to, the, to this works, of which a complete final result was denied to us by the cruel hands of death. He had only two volumes by 1934. In January 1934, all his Indological scholars have entitled A Loss of a Friend, Philosopher, and Guide. He has devoted his lifetime to Sanskritic studies and acted as luminous exponent of the cultural heritage of India. No doubt we have ever remembered him with gratitude as an interpreter of the ancient civilization. Thank you, sir. So uh, may I now request you to kindly moderate the, the session, please? Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Welcome to all. Uh, so first of all, we have um, thank you for inviting us. And uh, we have our eminent, eminent, eminent panelist, Dr. Sushma Njatu, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, I would like to request uh, some highlights on the various works of Dr. Winternitz. Uh, Thank you so much, Abhijit ji, and namaste to all of you. And I would like to thank uh, Austrian Embassy for having invited me today for this special session on Morris Winternitz. And I would also like to thank Muniz ji, whom I could not meet in my office. Uh, thank you so much, Achal ji. Thanks a lot. So uh, Morris Winternitz for me is like a guru and uh, Incidentally, uh, to begin with, I would like to tell uh, Munish ji when he talked to me about the subject. So I brought the book with me, and I told you it's in my uh, home. This is the first volume of the history of Indian literature. So uh, by the flags, you can actually make it that how do actually the Sanskritists, or for that mat matter, the student of Indic studies uses it. Uh, so to begin with, I would like to pay my obeisance to uh, Maurice Winternitz as a guru, Ajnana Timirandasa Gyananjana Shalakaya Chakshur Unmilitam Yena Tasma Shri Guruve Namaha. So uh, paying obeisance to the most revered great guru, the shloka would mean like this, who removes ignorance and darkness of the unenlightened by applying the ointment of true knowledge and wisdom to his eyes. So for me, this has been a privilege, of course, to be here because of two main reasons. Primarily that it has been a privilege, of course, to be here because of two main reasons. Primarily that I have been using these three volumes for the last almost 20, 25 years. And uh, as I belong to Kashmir, so uh, in it's almost in 1990 when we had to leave that place. So the books and everything remained at Kashmir. And uh, while my entry into Indira Gandhi National Center for the Arts, we had uh, Professor Kaya Charan Tripathi, who was those days uh, our head of the Kalakosh division. So you know, just one of the conversations, I just asked him that I wanted to have one history of Indian literature. And he is the person who actually advised me to have, although I knew it before also, 
during my post graduation classes or before that so uh, that's where the journey of mine started with morris internets and second and the most important point of this uh, these volumes is that once i started consulting them regarding any of the aspects of index studies i i found out uh, the great relationship of uh, morris internets with my family because one of my uh, my father's uncle mahamahu padhyay jagaddar zadu whom uh, the indian index studies scholars know has done uh, the critical edition of nilmat puran so he is mentioned in uh, here in page number 556 volume 1 section 2 while uh, it's the uh, contribution of kashmiri sanskritists is being delineated by morris internets so already uh, i think nf has been talked about the life by my uh, young uh, brother like um, abhijit dikshit ji so i would also like to go just very briefly uh, about the life of morris winternitz and how profound scholar he was both in german and sanskrit of course in english also because while we go into the history of indian literature we see that the first two volumes were very much translated into english when he was very much there and he himself revised both the volumes unfortunately uh, when the third volume was translated he could not revise that himself the english translation side of it so we uh, through abhijit ji we have already known that he was born in um, horn austria and he went uh, he he went ahead. i don't I, i think i don't need to talk about what he did uh, where he studied Uh, because that's already been done so the interesting thing about uh, morris winternitz is that before without even visiting india he is a scholar of indic studies and is a profound sanskrit scholar who takes his phd thesis he takes his research on uh, apastamba grihya sutra which is one of the branches of the vedic literature and i think even today scholars and young students do not dare taking such subjects for their phd thesis so this is in 1892 and this the uh, the research has been done so profoundly that it got published later and uh, in in 1892 it got published by imperial academy of sciences and in the meanwhile in 1887 winter winternitz published the first critical edition of apastambhi grah sutra so if we start uh, entering into the vedic the, the first volume actually talks about the vedas and uh, the um, actually the veda and the whole vedic literature and then later we go to the epics and the puranas also which is also mentioned in the first volume so uh, this is this is the kind of scholarship the unparalleled scholarship of uh, professor morris winternitz who who dare taking such kind of subjects and we can imagine in 19th century how much of the manuscripts were available that also in germany and um, in austria and in oxford where he actually started work from his career from uh, at austria and then incidentally he started traveling ahead so uh, uh, that that would that is a wonderful thing for me to realize today when we are sitting in this uh, hugely technical uh, technically facilitated world and uh, while morris winternitz would have had uh, could have had laid his hands on very few manuscripts of uh, uh, sanskrit studies or for that matter uh, vedic studies uh, he also became an assistant to uh, max muller we were on that day talking about max muller so he became max muller's uh, assistant at oxford such a humble person who started who started his journey right from becoming an assistant of a great scholar those days who was max muller who already had started working on indic studies of sanskrit studies especially later he worked there as a teacher lecturer even the librarian of indian institute of oxford he was also the uh, on the examination board of indian civil services he also uh, he was also appointed as a professor at prague 
when he met Gurudev Rabindranath Tagore in the year 1921, and then on his insistence, he comes to India to Shantini Ketan. He traveled, one more significant thing is that he traveled extensively in India during that period, that's between February 1923 to September 1924. And he speaks on myriad subjects of Indic studies in fluent Sanskrit in Indian, wherever congregations on the pundits he meets. He does not need any other language to speak to the pundits of India because he could very well verse in Sanskrit itself. So that is the kind of great scholarship this great scholar had. Vintanit's uh, erudition of Sanskrit language can be perceived by the fact that while assisting Max Muller in the preparation of the second edition of the Rig Veda, he added copious references to the original text, collated manuscripts. That's a wonderful thing he did those days. I think today it's sitting in this hall, I'm sure very little people would be knowing the collation, the critical edition, which is something very, very, as Achalji was telling, that we at Kalakosh Division do basically that. Because if you have tens of manuscripts of one particular text, to make a critical edition means you have to read all those hundred manuscripts and then you can finally come up with one final uh, reading, which will be the final reading. So imagine this uh, great scholar working on 49 volumes of the sacred books of the East and collating the manuscripts. And the kind of huge index he prepared, which was later published, the index of these sacred books of the East was later published in 1910 under a concise dictionary of Eastern religion. So something remarkable. Uh, the contribution which Morris Winternitz has done. He has also contributed several articles on Indo and Indo-European religion. So I think this is, this is something phenomenal what he has done. And he has also talked about the customs which we hardly would like to discuss today in the present day world. And he has also contributed these articles in several journals. He has also talked, he has written about Sarp Bali, an ancient snake cult. He has also written on the Shad, the ancestral rituals among Indo-European nations, on Soyamvar, on the choice of a bride according to Bharadwaj Grihe Sutra. So these are something, these are remarkable contributions apart from what he has written and what uh, sources we are having today available in our libraries. Vintanitz also wrote extens extensively on the Mahabharata and stressed the need of publishing the critical edition, as I was speaking earlier, of this great epic. For that, the manuscripts of Mahabharat housed at several European libraries were also collected, which helped Bandarkar Oriental Research Institute of Pune to prepare a critical edition of the epic, in which Winternitz was also made a member of the honorary board of referees, as well as he was one, of one among the editorial board, and which incidentally got published in 1918. And Maurice Winternitz definitely uh, uh, stressed the need of collating the uh, manuscripts which were available in south of India along with the manuscripts which uh, were available in north of India. So we, is, is that okay? So, yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. so I uh, I conclude here. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for your patience. So as I am having three volumes, you will have to tell me to stop. No, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for uh, for such a uh, in fact adding to the introduction, which uh, will set a tone uh, for yeah. the panel discussion sure, now. Sure. Thank you Let's so much, ma'am. Let's go ahead. Thank now, you, Ajay. Uh, I'll again request uh, Abhijit ji to uh, kindly moderate the session and also uh, look at the time. Thank, thank you, sir. <laughs> sir, uh, coming to the next. Sir, uh, I'm now we are requesting for Professor Girishna Jha, sir. Sir, as we know, uh, we have a great works of internet, and we have just listened that uh, so many works have been done by internet. But why this uh, Indology, uh, famous Indological person has not got much recognition in the field of Indology and all. And please also put some highlights on the chronological narratives and opinion and percept perceptions what we have in the field of Indology, sir. That's, I'll second with the first question because <laughs> I would also like to know his as to, I mean, such a, a historian, you know, scholar mm -hmm. who has been in 
invited by none other than Rabindra, Gurudev Rabindra Nath, you know, when he's worked uh, so immensely. What is the reason as such that this person is not, uh, you know, has gained that sort of a uh, landmark, you know? What could be there? Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Vijit Ji. And thanks to the embassy for organizing, is actually planning this event on vintage, long forgotten, you know, uh, 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 historiographer of Indian literature. Uh, I wouldn't call him father of Indian literature, but a father of Indian literary historiography, right? Perhaps. So thank you so much for actually looking at vintage again after several you know, uh, decades of uh, you know, forgetting him. And why he is forgotten, you know, uh, if you look at the situation in India and, and Europe and America, how Indology has evolved over the years. 19th century Indology was very different than what we have today. And in India, despite the fact that we have 18 universities exclusively for Sanskrit, right? The, the medium of instruction is uh, mostly non-English in most of the universities. Vinton uh, writes in English language, uh, translated into English. And that too, a little bit of an archaic English, so not very favorable among students in India. Though I had a chance to uh, follow his book uh, in bachelor's when I was doing Sanskrit, because my father gave me the three volumes, Motila Banarsidas, and asked me to read uh, those volumes of internet. So it's quite fascinating why he's not uh, very popular today. But if you look at the overall Indology uh, field, you know, uh, um, Certainly, there is a there's a corner where uh, Minton is sits and he works uh, assiduously on on literature of India and very detailed account of Indian literature he has produced. And as as Madam said, that the first volume is, is Vedas, mostly Vedas, Upanishads, and then you have the Puranas, epics, you know, and uh, and the second volume is mostly the heterodox literature, Buddhism and Jainism. And again, uh, to, to separate uh, Buddhism and Jainism from the mainstream literature, again, may not be a good idea to do that. And third category, of course, is the classical Sanskrit. And, you know, uh, it starts with Ashwaghosha, you know, again, he's a Buddhist writer, Ashwaghosha. And then he ends in the scientific literature. And uh, he calls, very interestingly, you know, uh, even Dharma Shastra is a scientific literature. Um, that's uh, something that people will question, you know, because scientific literature today would mean Ayurveda, medical sciences, you know. And, and engineering uh, and, and linguistics, for example, physics, you know, for that matter. But he has his own way of classifying literature, and he has been a very mature uh, 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 you know, um, historiographer of literature of India, uh, who came after a long list of people, Weber, you know, and Keith, uh, MacDonald, etc., who uh, came out with shorter version of uh, Indian literature. Someone, you know, catalogued 500 texts, someone catalogued 200 texts. But here is a person who did a comprehensive account of Indian literature. Now, why he is uh, uh, relegated to the background? If you look at the 19th century, fascinating time of, of you know, uh, uh, Indology, where uh, you know the Indology of Sanskrit is, is, a, is a most fascinable subject to study in Europe. There are so many departments of Sanskrit opening up, and more so after the so-called common source, you know, uh, thing discovery of Sanskrit by William Jones, you know, where he talks about the Latin, Greek, and Sanskrit. Uh, fascinatingly very close and there should be something uh, above uh, that language which uh, gave birth to these languages. And his uh, version of Shakuntala uh, was uh, appreciated by everyone. So the maturity of Sanskrit literature, its antiquity, etc., all attracted the attention of the West. And there was a famous, uh, you know, I would say the, all the big guys were working on comparing the comparative philology uh, kind of exercise where they were comparing the Sanskrit, uh, uh, you know, uh, terms with the Greek terms and Latin, adding Persian to it, and trying to find out where the similarities are, right? And then the Kentum versus Shatam sound change laws, and they placed Proto-Indo-European above Indo-European to make sure that the, you know, certain direction of movement was justified. So that was certainly there. So that, and then, you know, if you are theorizing something, coming up with sound laws, sound change laws, and, and then the textbooks are written accordingly, then you get a prime position in the departments of Sanskrit where Sanskrit is being studied, right? And to, to study a foreign language in a European department, you need to have uh, some textbooks, right? So you would 
perhaps go for uh, some some uh, basic stories, uh, mostly stories from the Mahabharata, stories from Rig Veda, uh, not actually coming to the classical literature yet. For example, Shakuntala episode of Mahabharata would be favorable than the Kalidasa Shakuntala. Well, that is more complicated, right? So similarly, the Nalada Miyanti story from Mahabharata would be better than in, you know the actual ancient epic uh, of Sanskrit. So they would uh, first collect stories of uh, these kind to be taught in the foreign department, and to do that, they need a fragment of grammar of Sanskrit. So they would create uh, some kind of grammar which would be followed by the Western crowd, and for grammar you need a word list, so they would prepare a glossary of words. And this was a very popular exercise, right, to make sure Sanskrit is taught. And then there was another very important exercise of the uh, manuscripts collection. And early Bori was there, and an Asiatic society was formed. But still, since we were a colony, access to our manuscripts were easy uh, for the West, and uh, they were e they were easily you know, bought uh, uh, from Indians because uh, there were a lot. Still, you know, we have 30,000 private collections even in three states of India: Odisha, Bihar, and 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 and, and you know, uh, uh, Madhya Pradesh, uh, Odisha, Bihar, and Uttar Pradesh. Uh, more than 30,000 collections, private collections in India. That time, there would have been more. So it was easy to acquire manuscripts and then you know uh, produce authentic, authentic versions, and uh, make sure they are uh, taken away from here and protected nicely. And that was and also a study of inscriptions. And to do that, they and to publish books, you have to basically uh, come up with uh, you know a typecast. Charles Wilkins uh, was a very important scholar who learned Sanskrit for the first time, and he was able to produce Bhagavad Gita in English originally. And he uh, himself cut the types so that he could you know cast a uh, print a grammar book. So it's a lot of passion from the European scholars, you know, uh, in in getting things out. Now the, this category of uh, you know uh, publishing uh, history of uh, Sanskrit literature was already dominated by uh, Weber, uh, you know, uh, Keith, MacDonald, etc., and they uh, came up with shorter versions of, of history of Sanskrit literature. And they were not paying a lot of attention, actually, on to the origin of Sanskrit, a controversial, a controversial question, origin of Sanskrit, the direction of movement, all of that was, you know, mired with a lot of controversy. The Kentum Shatam still is controversial. The, the, you know, uh, the discovery of Bangani language, which is a dialect of uh, Garhwali in, in Uttarakhand, has all, you know, uh, Kentum properties, which is not supposed to be in India, as per the sound change laws from the velar to palatal, you know, and that justifies movement from west to east, west to east. So all of that was controversial, and people actually who were creating theories to justify a certain direction of movement uh, got more popularity. Not uh, the people who were trying to write histories of literature, right? But what uh, Vintenius did was, was uh, phenomenal because he was the first historian of Indian literature who went through the manuscripts, you know, and then was able to call it, since he had already worked on Griya Sutra himself, and was fascinated by the Indo-European mythology, like you know, wedding rituals and other, other many other rituals. If you today do a translation of the vows that the Christian weddings you know, do and the Indian weddings, you'll find a lot of similarity. And, and many more actually, the gods, and Indo-European gods and other, other things. Uh, so he had a lot of fascination for that. And, and uh, Grace Sutra, of course, was uh, the product of that. He published a detailed version of uh, Grace Sutra. And, but his work, you know, uh, spanning into three volumes was very, very detailed. And it caught the attention of uh, uh, Indians, the erudite Indian scholarship, which he was always scared of. He says in his book that my book is not for the, the learned circles. He says my book is for the educated national scholars, you know, who can, who either have no idea about Indian literature or want to go a little deeper into that. When Max Muller did the fantastic uh, edition of, uh, of Rig Veda, he was also scared about, by the criticism that he might face from the, the erudite uh, scholars of Sanskrit in India. There are two kinds of people who work on Sanskrit in the West. One, the majority writes about Sanskrit, about Indology, but the, 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 there's a minority who knows Sanskrit language and goes deeper into the text. And, and Winton is what one such scholar who actually had knowledge of Sanskrit and could go into the text and, and, and call out information. So many of his remarks are very important uh, for us to study and for us to follow. And the reason he was uh, he's not very popular, he's not alone because all the uh, 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 historians of Sanskrit literature are not very popular with the exception of the M. Krishnamacharya, uh, who did a very detailed account of Indian history. And of course, those historians of Indian literature who did it in vernacular media, like Hindi, 
Hindi medium literature of uh, history of uh, Indian literature and are more popular with students because they can follow that much more. So Vinton Nears has certainly done a phenomenal work and his work is uh, there, but I believe uh, if there is a Hindi translation of his work and I'm surprised that the no Indian language translation has come out of, of his work so far. And uh, if Motilal agrees, uh, I can perhaps uh, take up the Hindi translation of at least the first volume. And I remember a long time back, I had, I had you know, uh, 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 spoken to Motilal when Cardona was visiting uh, our department, George Cardona, and I was uh, having a look at the J.F. Stahl's A Reader of Sanskrit Grammarian, a very, very uh, prominent work. And that again has an archaic English and not very popular with these Indian universities of Sanskrit because they can't follow that archaic English. So I had proposed to Motilal that we will do a, a Hindi translation of the entire volume, and Cardona had agreed to be the editor of that. But Motilal, again, perhaps is very slow uh, in, 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 in going uh, forward in that direction. So uh, we might you know, uh, look at uh, uh, publishing some vernacular uh, uh, version of uh, this great, great book that, you know, uh, a fascinating account. And some of the remarks that he has made about Tantra literature, Tantra happens to be the least worked uh, uh, body of literature in India. Tantra, uh, and if, if you talk about Tantra literature in, I mean, Sanskrit department, they will say, oh, no, Tantra is uh, non-Vedic, non-mainstream, not even heterodox. So let us put it in the background. So anything which questions the mainstream is relegated to the background. Right? So uh, um, it's possible there are some of the remarks that, you know, uh, 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 Vinton uh, um, came on the chronology of the Sanskrit literature, the question that you asked, may have been opposed uh, by, by the mainstream scholars of India. And he himself is, uh, uh, um, he says that, uh, is hovering in the air, the phrase he uses, that my account of the Indian literature chronology is, is, is very, you know, uh, patchy. That's what, you know, he says. Because it's, it's not possible for anybody to come up with a concrete account of the, the dates in Indian literature. Mahabharata recently has been dated to 3800 BCE. So that would push Rig Veda back to at least 4500 BCE, right? So then we have had a count of 7,000 years of continuous intellectual history. So more you know, data comes from bottom up, like the Indian languages study, you know, uh, the families of Indian languages, and the new data from Bangani, and from, from top down, you know, uh, from various accounts, you know, genetics, et cetera, et cetera. So dates are basically uh, changing all the time. So it's been not possible uh, for anybody to come up with a concrete account. But he gave an account of 3,000 years of a continuous intellectual history, you know, which is actually very conservative, very, very conservative. That would be opposed by, by people who are so, so fascinated by the antiquity of Rig Veda and all. So uh, certainly, I would say uh, these would have been uh, the reasons why uh, um, uh, you know, uh, a person like Maurice Vinternish was not given the due credit that he should have gotten uh, among the leading ind Indologists of the world. And Indology today has certainly diverged into new areas. If you go to uh, um, you know, in, any, any American university or European university, I've been to many, many universities. Uh, I taught a Sanskrit 101 course in UMass Dartmouth, and uh, one of the gentlemen asked me whether the Aryans, whether the Brahmins uh, came to India on horses and brought Sanskrit to India. And this is what uh, they learn in their textbooks. And, and uh, but there's a lot of passion about Sanskrit. You know, no matter uh, how you perceive it, there's a lot of passion about Sanskrit. And so I think Indology today is mostly South Asia studies, uh, Hindustani studies, is study of uh, Bollywood and uh, Gandhi, et cetera, et cetera. Not so much of Sanskrit texts as was done in the 19th century so passionately, you know, so closely. So uh, even in the Heidelberg University, not much work coming uh, 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 for Sanskrit, you know, the, the key Sanskrit texts. I was in the uh, University of Würzburg uh, teaching digital humanities, and uh, there is some interest, you know, uh, uh, in, in uh, some rituals, uh, some, some religious practices, etc. culture specific, not really text specific. So I have advised to many of the universities I have visited to please collect a good uh, you know, a section of manuscripts in, in your university. For example, in Van Pitt Library, University of Pennsylvania has a very good collection of manuscripts of Sanskrit. And I, I visited there, though a lot of the manuscripts are actually not even Sanskrit, they are Rajasthani language, and they call it Sanskrit. But then they are protecting those manuscripts, preserving them with a lot of effort and a lot of you know, uh, you know, uh, zeal and, and, and passion. So something of that kind actually uh, uh, should be uh, done in India. I'm very happy that IGNCA 
and Professor Lal, etc., are working a lot, uh, giving a lot of effort on creating Sanskrit manuscripts. And I'm sure uh, with the collaboration with uh, the Austrian Embassy and the and the IGNCA, maybe Jane, you also can barge in. We should uh, institute some closer studies of some of the work that uh, Winton has done. For example, Griya Sutras. He was fascinated by Dharma Shastras. We can perhaps look into Dharma Shastras more closely. And uh, as I tell my colleagues in JNU that you should come up with something like a contemporary Dhamshastra text and a new Dhamshastra. So thank you so all you. Uh, very much uh, for giving the opportunity to me. And I'm sure um, there'll be a lot more coming up in the following discussions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks a lot, sir. Now, coming to the point of manuscripts and all these things, I would like to ask Dr. Rachel Pandya, sir. Then we have done seen the Bori and uh, the uh, another institutes like Bandarkar and uh, so many institutes have done the several critical edition of type of work. So can you p please put some light on this type of work? In Actually, first of all, I would like to add on what uh, Professor Jha uh, just spoke, uh, a little thing, that he has given us a deliverable uh, for this panel discussion, which is like we should come up with a Hindi translation of this. And I think three institutions, uh, Austrian Cultural Forum, uh, IGNCA, and uh, JNU, uh, we can really join hands and uh, take uh, this further. This is really a, an excellent uh, deliverable. And this is the reason why we all are sitting here in uh, such cultural forums. So uh, in fact, when you were saying it, uh, it's a uh, that Winternitz was uh, a father of Indian literature. Uh, I think if we say that he was perhaps the father of Indian manuscriptology, will be, I think, uh, in, will be fit uh, thing for it. Uh, and my co the question that Abhijit ji just uh, put, put to me about writing, uh, speaking on the critical editions, uh, the textual uh, criticism, that is the monumental work of Winternitz. And uh, imagine that uh, he came up with 49 volumes of sacred book uh, of, of the East, even uh, remembering the names of these uh, 49 volumes is difficult for us. But uh, Winternitz at that time was able to uh, came up with uh, such monumental work. I think is uh, worth. It's it's really pra praiseworthy. And then uh, Sushma Ma'am also uh, told about it uh, about the the critical edition of Mahabharata. In fact, the seeds for the critical edition of Mahabharata were sown by Winternitz. What the Mahabharata that we know today is was not available in uh, 19th century. In, in in 20th century, it was available in bits and pieces in different uh, manuscripts, which were all around the world. And uh, there was a, a committee which was formed under the leadership of uh, V. S. Uh, Sukhtankar ji, uh, which came up with this critical edition of Mahabharata. And uh, it was a phenomenal work uh, in the, I think, in the world of Sanskrit, where 50 years were spent, where uh, thousands of manuscripts were, uh, were critically edited by, by a big team. And uh, in this team was also uh, Winternitz. But in the, earlier to uh, the project, the work was done on the uh, critical edition of Mahabharata by Winternitz. So I, I can really say that the seeds uh, for the critical edition of Mahabharata and this, uh, all these volumes were inaugurated in, I think, 1952 uh, by the President of India, the other than the President of India, uh, Dr. Rajendra Prasad. And even today, uh, it, this monumental work of critical edition of Mahabharata is considered to be the uh, one of the ratnas of uh, Indian uh, uh, of Indian uh, cri critical edition and bringing uh, bringing uh, to masses the uh, what is written in the manuscripts in easier 
easier versions. And again, I will repeat that the seeds were sown by winter needs. That's why I don't know whether if you want to disagree with me, uh, if we call him as the father of Indian manuscriptology, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and uh, uh, we all know that uh, when Max Muller, uh, he, uh, Professor uh, Max Muller, he uh, came up with the second edition of uh, of uh, of uh, Vedas, that was uh, again uh, the assistant was uh, Mr. Uh, Winternitz, and uh, the second edition is better than the first edition uh, of of Max Muller. So I think Winter Winternitz had the knack of uh, critical uh, edition of uh, of manuscripts, which is a tedious process. I have studied uh, manuscriptology, but not as uh, detailed as uh, uh, Sanskrit faculties on both the sides uh, of me. It, it is a really, a, even with today with the help of all these uh, informatics tools, it takes a lot of time. You have to see uh, which, what are the differences, which is the first thing is identifying the original Manuscript is the most 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 difficult work, and a uh, person like uh, like me will not be able to do it because I don't have that uh, base in Sanskrit. So first thing is that you need to have the base in that language where, whose critical edition you want to to bring out. So uh, Winter needs being an Austrian. Uh, brought and brought up in Austria, then uh, studying in uh, Prague, and uh, then went on to uh, Oxford. No uh, direct connection to India, was able to do it uh, by remaining in Europe. So that, I think, is the dedication. And uh, this type of dedication is really not seen in um, even above average students that we find uh, today or 50 years back in Indian universities. So that's what I, I'll, I'll say that the, the, criti the bringing out the uh, critical edition, the textual uh, criticism uh, was, I think, started by, started by means uh, mastered by uh, winter needs. And I think that should become part of the course of manuscriptology in India. Thank you. Thanks a lot, sir. Uh, can I add? Yeah. Yeah, please, sir. I think the Sacred Book of East uh, with 50 or 47 volumes was done by Max Muller. And one of the uh, uh, volumes in that was done by uh, Winter. Yeah. And if I can, if I may also add is that uh, as HLG is uh, talking about the manuscripts, so uh, Winternitz, he is basically inspired by George Bueller. So George Bueller comes before him, and Bueller has gone to all across India and collected manuscripts, as uh, Professor Ja was saying. So he actually followed Winternitz, followed. But Bueller also came to India and himself collected. And then we have a huge story how Oral Stein came down, and he was a student of Bueller. So uh, like making certain assertions here, I thought it's better. I make an interjection. Thank you. So, time, uh, I would like to Professor Sudhi Lal sir to give some highlights on cultural ethos in the perspective of Indology, um, especially in the view of Bharat Vidya. Uh, thank you, thank you, Abhijiji, and uh, I. I also thank all the. Uh, organizers of this event and uh, the distinguished panelists. Uh, uh, when, when Munish ji first came to me, uh, he told me that uh, uh, it, it is more going to be like uh, an informal session and uh, we can have some storytelling here. So let me tell you a story. Uh, is it allowed? <laughs> I'll, I'll, uh, I'll present a very small story. Uh, it is from uh, uh, Vishnu Dharmotar Puran. Uh, it's a very interesting dialogue between uh, King Vajra and the sage Markandeya. Uh, King Vajra wishes to build a temple with icons that may always manifest the deities. He seeks 
the instructions of his guru, uh, sage Markandeya. Uh, Vajra says, uh, how should I make the form of the gods so that the images may always manifest the deity? So Markandeya replies, someone who is not familiar with the principles of painting or the Chitra Sutram can never know the art of making icons or the Pratimalakshan. Then he says, uh, uh, if that is the case, please uh, explain to me the canon of painting. To this Markandeya says, it is very difficult to know the principles of painting without the art of dance, the Nritya Shastra. For in both, the world is to be represented. Then Vajra says, then pray, uh, please tell me uh, the principles of dance. So to that Markandeya responds, if someone is not familiar with the principles of instrumental music or atodya, it is extremely difficult for him to understand dance. So then he pleads, O oh sage, then please instruct me about the instrumental music as to when the instrumental music is properly understood, only then one could one understand the dance. So Markandeya says, without the knowledge of uh, vocal music or Gita, it is impossible to know about the instrumental music. So then he says, please explain to me the canons of uh, vocal music. Uh, then he says, vocal music is to be understood uh, as a uh, subject to recitation and that can be done in two ways the prose or the poetry so <laughs> this is a long dialogue so this is important here because uh, this is something Morris Winternitz did when he was writing his history of Indian literature uh, we have to uh, we have to see the Indic knowledge tradition as a composite whole where uh, not everything is in isolation or in silos. This is all interconnected. Sarvam hi sarvatmakam, says the Heva Jritantra. So uh, all the art forms, all the forms are related to something or the other. So unless and until we have this basic clarity, uh, we uh, we would not be able to do justice to uh, our pursuits. So I think um, as, as our distinguished panelists have already uh, outlined uh, about uh, the history of Indian literature, I think he presented a model. And uh, as uh, Professor Jha rightly pointed out, uh, it might be one of the reasons that he is not so popular because uh, another Another person, another historiographer of Indian literature, uh, Jean Gonda, who produced uh, copious volumes of uh, history of Indian literature, and uh, he also encompassed the uh, the likes of uh, Kashmiri literature and Hindi literature and Tamil literature, uh, all wonderfully edited volumes. He is not so popular. Uh, the, the the complete set is not so popular among students because it's, these are very terse texts. So um, this might be one of the reasons. I don't know. Uh, so uh, I think uh, uh, we, he deserves an ode from our side. Thank you, Lord Phil. Purnat purna mudachyate. Purna se hi purna ki prapti hoti hai. So as you can see, we all have so many things to say, but the time restricts us. So now I would like to welcome Minu Monish, sir, to conclude the session and we can formal. Ask question also, sir. So, uh, yeah. Question yeah, please, please. If you like to listen to some panelists. Yes. Yeah, please, sir. So you can give one more. Okay. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. Okay. No, no, he, he was the, in the panel of... Uh, panel of... Yes. Yes, sir. Uh, I mean, could you elaborate that a bit? No, thanks. Yes, sir. He is the, he is the examiner, sir. He is the examiner of Indian Civil Services. 
Uh, and while, can, yeah, please. Sir. Can I see the Indian civil service exams had about 40 marks of Sanskrit compulsory, and then about 30 marks of Persian and some Latin. So Sanskrit questions were there. So you had to have someone who can actually set the question paper and also yeah. examine. And after they were selected, then they had to be trained. And for training also, you need a lot of Sanskrit texts, you know, which, which they will be you know, taught. Because you have to come to India, they have to know Indian culture. And Sanskrit texts are critical for understanding Sanskrit, uh, Indian culture. So that was the background, actually. Basically, Emo's uh, call for the Sanskrit language is to so At Oxford, he was also you know, working as examiner for ICS. So uh, he was working as examiner for ICS. Sanskrit subject right. for ICS. Exactly. And was selected by the Britishers as well. Right, so because he was a prominent was scholar prominent of Sanskrit. Scholar. He could read Sanskrit texts because of his PhD P uh, on Greek Sutras. So he was very prominent already and he was working with uh, Max Muller anyway. So he was selected. After the candidates are selected in the ICS, they have to be trained. Right. Uh, in training also, you need Sanskrit texts because you have right. to know about Indian culture. So thank you very much. Sir Jha, sir. sir, as you were saying, uh, there was a sparkling interest in Sanskrit language in 19th century across Europe. Like, what was the cause of that? <laughs> Very good question. The, the so-called discovery of Sanskrit. Indians knew Sanskrit anyway, but we were so, f you know, we have problem of plenty. We have things all around us, we don't care. But then when the Europeans, uh, you know, uh, got into the translation, you know, as you said, Bengal, and Shakuntala was translated into English. Of course, not directly, because there were no Sanskrit scholar who knew English. So Sanskrit to Persian, Persian to English. That was the mode. And in that process, a lot of inaccuracies would creep in in, this, in the English translation. So that, you know, aroused a lot of interest about the maturity of Sanskrit literature in the West, in, in, in Europe, actually. And that fascinated the Western mind, that how can a language in India be so mature? And then also he talks about the, some common source, Sanskrit, Greek, Latin, so similar and we add Persian to it. So there must be some common source, you know. He says that I don't know how old Sanskrit is, but there must be some common source from which all these languages came, up and came out. And that also led to a lot of interest in learning Sanskrit uh, in the West. Uh, yeah, although you have not asked me this question, but I would like to tell you that, uh, uh, as Professor Jha has said, I think it was philology which was being taught in European universities. If you look at the maximum Indologists who have come from Europe to India and worked on, particularly on Sanskrit. So it was because of philology they were taught. And through philology, they reached Sanskrit. This is also one of the reasons how they reached. Because all the classical languages they used to teach there. And Sanskrit would be one among the classical languages. So this is how, but I think the philology as uh, now Professor Jai is from JNU, I would like to request him that we should actually in Indian curriculum add uh, this aspect so that uh, that multidisciplinary work is done by the students. Thank uh, you. Still so today in the European departments uh, and in American departments of linguistics, I was in Florence University. Uh, I was I thought I can boast about Panini Astadhyayi. And the HOD says we teach Panini Astadhyayi here in Florence <laughs> University. But in Indian departments of linguistics, don't, they don't teach Panis Astadhyayi. Now, in, in the uh, University of Illinois, where I did my master's, my guru, Hans Hock, you know, uh, there you have to have either Greek, Latin, or Sanskrit to do historical linguistics. It's compulsory. Because you can't do historical linguistics, anything in the language of science, the science of language, you can't do without Sanskrit, Greek, or Latin. So it's so essential, you know. But in India, our curricula is so, uh, I don't know, hackneyed towards something I don't know what, what drives the motivation in not including Sanskrit. It's so useful for any, anything you do in linguistics. Especially when you talk about Indo-European languages. So uh, Sanskrit is one, one of the keys. I think sometime before I was reading, Mahatma Gandhi said, if we will not teach Sanskrit to the youngsters, we will be all illiterates. No, no, the whole of 19th century was <laughs> history of linguistics, historical linguistics. Sanskrit was important there too. Absolutely. The 20th century is structural linguistics. Panani is there. 
All the Pandit is there. So uh, you can't avoid Sanskrit in any way you do. Uh, like like Maurice Winton uh, has written, if we wish to learn the, to understand the beginnings of our own uh, own culture, if we wish to understand the oldest uh, Indo-European culture, we must go to India, uh, where the oldest literature of Indo-European people is preserved. This is what Winton would say. Add to that, uh, I'm sorry, I would be speaking more about it because. Uh, to add to it, and it's been already mentioned uh, in the very foreword, which has been written by Winton it's himself, he says that this book, today we think it's a, it's a very, very scholarly work, but he himself admits that it's for a common person in the Europe, because they're not having, it's a niche for them to Indian literature. It's not for any scholar, but the kind of copious notes which he has presented and the details of m numerous manuscripts which were available those days in German libraries. So that then he says that those kind of notes are for somebody who is a scholar or a student. But the general thing is for a common person of a Europe who wants to understand Indian literature. And though he was a little bit skeptical about the response that he would get from the, the academic circles in India, yeah. Yeah. but he was praised by everyone he was in absolutely India. praised. Uh, same was the case for Max Muller. Uh, nobody questioned yeah. his editing of the Rig Veda. Absolutely. So profoundly done. So the, some of the European scholars, in, uh, George Cardona himself, I, I call him the greatest Pandanian today, in, in, in the world today. Mm -hmm. So some of these scholars have done phenomenal work, much mm -hmm. more phenomenal than the Indians could do. Absolutely. And I think there is a lot that we can emulate. But again, the books have to be done in Indian languages, because the, there's no tradition of English and English-like uh, uh, medium for uh, studying Indology in India. There are 18 universities of Sanskrit in India. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's a lot of resources that is available. Sir, he has not on, um, highlighted only the Apastambiya Dharma Sutra, even Bharadwaj Griya Sutra yes, also he yes, has done. Yes. Of course mm -hmm. he had the knowledge of... So uh, maybe we are concluding, but I am intrigued to uh, share uh, one more story like Sudhirji was mentioning. And I'm also talking about one more scholar from Hungary, uh, Oral Stein. And as uh, the scholars here would be knowing, he has translated Raj Tarangini, the very famous history, historiography of Kashmir, into Sanskrit. So about the critical addition of that petty Orlstein also is uh, a little junior to uh, Maurice Winternitz. He comes in 1890s, uh, and he's also from Oxford, and Bueller is his teacher, like that. So uh, one very interesting story about having the translation of Raj Tarangini. Hope you have, are you a student? Okay, okay, doesn't matter. So we are having uh, the Raj Tarangini is the uh, source material. It's written in 12th century by Kalhan of Kashmir. And the English translation has been incidentally done by Hungarian scholar called Sir Oral Stein. So Stein comes to Kashmir and he looks for the manuscripts. Already his teacher, Bueller, has told him, you better go to Kashmir, not to any other place, because their pandits are having these manuscripts. You better go there and you will have this Raj Tarangini. I have heard, but no pandit is doing, giving me the copy of uh, the manuscript. So uh, as uh, we were earlier discussing about, that, it was very much easy in reach, but somehow because the pandits in Kashmir, those days, 12th century, no, it's now in the uh, late uh, 20, 20, early, uh, late 19th century and early 20th century, so when Stein goes there, he, through his all good offices of administration of all uh, kingdom of uh, India, because we're still a uh, colonial uh, country that time, so all his good offices he used, and finally he comes to know that uh, some pandit is having this uh, manuscript of Raj Sarangini, which is written in Sharada script. So this opens another dialogue box here. So what is the script and then how many scripts we have in India for uh, writing only Sanskrit. So then he uh, requests them and then these pandits say, but Bueller had seen the whole, uh, this thing, manuscript of Raj Tarangini. But when uh, uh, Stein goes, he just happens to see the three brothers are having three portions of that heirloom which has been given by their ancestors. So Stein requests them and tells them that you give me this uh, manuscript. I'll just copy and hand it over back to you. Then you just read the foreword of the Raj Tarangini which has been uh, translated by Stein. So he says that these three 
bunches of uh, manuscripts, he just packs them and takes them to Oxford because there he wants to sit comfortably. He was uh, teaching here also in Lahore. So he wants to take these back and go to Oxford and make a beautiful edition of the, at least copy them. And how then he t tells this whole story that the porter forgets the box while he was traveling through ship. And when he sits inside and suddenly he comes, oh, I've just forgotten and these pundits of Kashmir are going to kill me once I go back or I don't have to go back to India. So, uh, but luckily what happens, the porter comes with the box and then Stein says, although it had got the Abhisheka, the Jal Abhisheka of the Samudra, but uh, the ink and the paper of the manuscript was not damaged at all. That was the kind of genius or the kind of techniques we were having those days. And uh, then he goes there and he copies this whole manuscript and it takes him again the same, it's almost five to ten years to get the critical edition done and the English translation, which is very much prevalent and present in the present day academic circles. So like that, there are, there are numerous thanks, stories. Thanks a lot, ma'am, for such a nice story. Rabindranath Tagore ji and Vishwa Bharti, you know, and who, how he contributed and what he also in return got from there. So it's always a give and take thing. So if something can be, you know, elaborated and can be told, be grateful. Anybody, right. this is for anybody. Well, he spent a year in, in, in uh, what Shanti Nikita, more than a little bit more than a year. He was teaching courses because he was a university professor. And also uh, traveling uh, and collecting uh, uh, manuscripts, you know, for his purpose. And during that time, I think he was also working on uh, 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 kind of a book on Tagore himself, which he published much la uh, later, 38 or something. After I think he died, yes. the, the book came out. So, uh, but he, he used the time in traveling and, and you know, he frequented, frequently visited Bori and other places to collect uh, manuscripts. That was uh, the thing, you know. Too short a time, uh, one year, you know, so, you know. I guess. Rabindranath Tagore. Because Rabindranath Tagore had visited uh, uh, there, Prague also, so he met. Uh, Can I add a little, uh, just yeah, one, please, one please, story? Please, yeah. Uh, yeah. Regarding <laughs> manuscripts, you know, manuscripts, uh, there are harrowing stories of manuscripts conditions in India, and we are so. Uh, Yes, so touchy about not giving manuscripts to people, you know, because they, yeah. you have to be up to Purush uh, to get the <laughs> manuscript. Uh, I have some first-hand experience because my students uh, worked on, uh, you know, uh, editing Atre Shiksha, Charani Shiksha, and Panini Shiksha. For Atre Shiksha, he got uh, no complete manuscript in India, even in uh, IGNC. I, I myself uh, went there to check the uh, manuscripts. Finally, we found it in Hamburg Library good condition, perfect condition. So they sent us the pictures of all the folios, but they charged us 1,300 euros to send the pictures. And then Genu Library actually paid it. We got a good condition manuscript. Then uh, Charani Shiksha was available in Lahore Library, very good condition, not in India, right? So we have a problem of plenty. We don't know how to handle our heritage well. So if someone is taking it out, why not? <laughs> I've seen Valpet Library, fantastic, very good, you know, situation there. The, the kind of care uh, for our manuscripts. I wish we should have something similar in India. We have to spend a lot of money to, do, to get that done. I think it calls for a lot of collaboration with embassies, you know, and the Indian Academy institutions, IGNCA, to do a concerted work. I have somewhere presented a uh, talk, I have uh, talked about a Shastra panel to be created because manuscriptology needs experts in these disciplines. Vastu, uh, Jyotisha, etc. Otherwise, you don't know, you know what exactly is there. For example, the Valpet Library is keeping Rajasthani manuscript. They're calling it Sanskrit manuscript. They don't know. Because, so we have to be, you know, uh, having an experts with us to actually get that done. Thank you. Thank you. So one more small story about the Bakshali manuscript, which is an Indian ma manuscript, uh, and it contains mathematics. So it must be interesting for all you youngsters. So that's also very much in the Oxford Library, Bodilian. So I incidentally worked for my PhD for that manuscript. But now recently I thought, let me again look at the manuscript and at least publish the thesis, I've not published it so far. So I wrote to Oxford, if at all they can give, and there was some carbon dating thing, is a huge 
tamasha made out of it and which scholars are not ex agreeing that it is that old they they are saying that there are th three four bunches and the story is another you all should uh, better do google and at least wikipedia will tell you what bakshali manuscript is so uh, that's what uh, i'm also like adding to the same thing how beautifully this bakshali manuscript is preserved in bodilian they're not letting anybody go inside and look in it's been very beautifully covered mm -hmm. all the and it, these are birch bark leaves mm -hmm. as a sharada manuscript so it's beautifully been preserved even for a scholar kind of a person they're not doing away they're saying the already jr kai has done one edition and then later one japanese scholar takao hayashi has also done one beautiful work of course but then if you really want to go being an indian being a kashmiri i know a little of sharada i learn little, little of sanskrit and i know a little of mathematics i would like to revisit but they won't give it to you they won't and here in the embassy and the people come into the place and they should actually help indian scholars i will tell you uh, takao hayashi who worked parallelly when i was working in kashmir on this bakshali manuscript and he he went to oxford he went to bodilian he could look into this manuscript that's how his study could and he com he compared this mathematical manuscript with another manuscript patan manuscript so he could achieve this kind of a beautiful work which is like unparalleled now there is no necessity of doing any other research on this but i wasn't satisfied with the kind of transliteration of this particular manuscript done by jr kai which is already published so i wanted to have a first hand look at the manuscript which is not being allowed till date so i think the, the, like that we'll be having several manuscripts at austrian at and i was, uh, I, was i wanted to talk about moksha pai uh, which is being which has been done in germany and the translation is nowadays in uh, european countries the translations are being done also in european languages not even in english so i think uh, definitely this is the place wherein the embassies could help indian students and the institutions by providing at least some kind of an entry into these such places thank you and there are lots of more stories but i think i should be stopping here yeah, yeah. Sir, we can find some more letters related to the ravinna tagore and exchange of uh, maurice williams in that particular book of ravinna tagore I, I, i have one suggestion uh, we really had a very nice uh, panel discussion here we should come up with a publication also some some short monograph on this if uh, yeah. you permit of course your forum we will take we yes. will i think so we will discuss on that and we yeah. can work on that yeah and i was also having a suggestion if uh, austrian embassy would love to have a chair why shouldn't they start a chair on morris winternitz because earlier your question was that why is he forgotten for me he is not a forgotten but uh, if yeah. the uh, if the embassy could have a chair on his name mm -hmm. and it can be very well established in any in, uh, institution in india or right. it can be done there yeah. so that will keep this scholar always there in right. the mm -hmm. collective consciousness thanks ma'am for the suggestion and for this last sentence we would like to conclude the session and i would like to call mr monish bahal sir for the final conclusion but time is always a constraint really i mean it was a wonderful evening so much to learn from our illustrious panelist and uh, we really wanted to continue with all this and uh, you know the discussion i wouldn't call it a discussion it was basically enlightening us you know from a different Uh, on on different aspects of this personality you see and uh, <clears throat> more we could you know work on this personality and i think so we are taking with us you know not only the 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 knowledge but at the same time the ideas which you have given to us 
There are a number of thanks to be given because without this, uh, their contribution, this would have not been possible. And uh, for this, I don't think, you know, I could really, you know, talk and speak and say thanks. I really don't want to miss anybody. I like to dis request my colleague if he can come up with a slide where the thanks of numerous personalities who contributed to this particular evening success was, was there. Could we have the slide, please? Well, next one. Next. That's the last one, I suppose. <laughs> so their contribution has been immense. But of course, we can nevertheless forget our panelists who have been here with us, that they deserve more than thanks. And for that, I request everybody who is in this hall to kindly give a standing ovation. Thank you very much. Pandya ji, thanks a million. Professor Sab, thanks. Thank you very much, madam. Thanks, sir. Next time, more stories, Mr. Lal. <laughs> this time, you only prepared with one story, you see. <laughs> Thank you.